All right, guys. Good Lord. The difference a couple of days makes it is now a cold, gray, gloomy Sunday morning here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here at the in the Point Lonesome Swamp, deep in the oasis of freedom, uh, where I no longer own Crazy Train Campground, so uh, I am now officially squatting on two properties for the time being. Uh, so while I figure out what I'm doing with my life, and uh, since it is Sunday, that would be Sunday, January 23rd, 2022. It is time for my weekly doomsday sermon where I just wade through all of the uh, mounting volcano produced tsunami of doom and gloom and uh, somehow I'm going to dredge up the energy. Uh, we're going to hear from this haughty little doomer chick I have never heard of in my life. Good Lord, uh, <laughs> Elizabeth Hagen Lawson, Elizabeth Hagen Lawson, uh, from this, uh, she was, had this paper published in academia.edu, all of this and brains too, good Lord, anyone, uh, who, Things all doom, that's you. I uh, can't be a haughty anti doomer chick. Anyway, let's look more at uh, Elizabeth's brain than her face. Take it away, Elizabeth. The cost of living in the Anthropocene. This is kind of doomer chick 101. The most recent epic. The Holocene has been a period of relative environmental stability, allowing humans to develop agriculture and establish settlements, culminating in modern civilization. Human activities have, have now reached such a scale that we, meaning humans, <clears throat> are having significant impacts on planetary systems and these effects are of sufficient magnitude to suggest, to suggest that we have triggered a new geological epoch, the Anthropocene. Neither climatic nor biogeochemical stability is likely to continue in the Anthropocene, and the Earth systems we rely on to provide a livable environment for human society are likely to become much less predictable. The stability of our infrastructure, the reliability of our production systems, and the livability of our cities will all be much less certain in the future. More research on the diverse aspects of global change will certainly, will certainly help to improve predictions on the timing and extent of changes, but will not alter the basic conclusion that we are doomed, actually. Uh, not quite what she said. The basic conclusion. Hmm. After reading the research, <clears throat> that global change is upon us. Yes. There is now a pressing need for much more interdisciplinary work addressing such questions as the global societal changes that must accompany responses to environmental change and dealing with the true economic consequences of a less predictable environment. Conceptualizing the challenges that face human humanity under the umbrella of the Anthropocene 
should allow different disciplines to collaborate and develop strategies for dealing with global change in a coherent and rational manner. Yes, apparently Elizabeth has never heard of Mad Max. Maybe she hasn't seen the pictures of those train yards uh, out there in L.A. Yes, uh, blah, blah, blah. Here we provide a summary of the environmental triggers that are pushing us into the Anthropocene and outline the consequences of transgressing the boundaries beyond which Earth systems are likely to become unstable. Blah, blah, blah. And then she goes on for 11 pages. 11 more pages of doom and gloom. Even the young, haughty, little uh, doomer chicks are getting it. Guys, uh, I've been preaching this to the choir for how many years now? And uh, guys, I I'm just letting you know uh, particularly uh, after closing the sale on this property, uh, I am having uh, some doomer doubts about whether this is what I want to do with my life. So anyway, we're going to change. We're going to change it up and have a little more fun on today's doomsday sermon, where our old buddy Michael Pollan, Michael Pollan, I. I like this dude. You all know who Michael Pollan, The Omnivore's Dilemma. I think that was Michael's book. And, but this is his new book. This is your mind on plants. This is your mind on plants where uh, Michael Pollan, he dives into uh, three psychoactive plants. He looks at the opium poppy, then he goes over there and looks at uh, mescaline, which is either peyote or San Pedro cactus. Uh, I was going to uh, do this sermon, uh, uh, read from his uh, booklet on uh, particularly the San Pedro cactus, which as much as anything turned me from a real estate uh, house flipper into a doomsday sermon. It was mescaline. It was San Pedro cactus that sent me tumbling down this, uh, down this rabbit hole uh, along with ayahuasca and psilocybin mushrooms. But Anyway, I have just foregone that because I know very few people, unfortunately, can relate to that. But we can all relate to his third one, caffeine. Caffeine, where uh, Michael Pollan uh, traces the story of caffeine, <clears throat> both coffee and tea. So we're just going to get a little taste of this excellent book. This is your mind on plants. Take it away, Michael Pollan. Tell us the story of caffeine. <clears throat> Our story about the cup of concentrated sunshine does seem to be darkening, and I am afraid it will darken further before it is over. A case can be made that coffee and tea did make a substantial positive contribution to the advance of quote-unquote civilization in the West, if by that we mean the various blessings of culture and capitalism, including the arts and sciences and the standard of living. But just as consumers of caffeine eventually must pay a biological price for the energy supplied by their drug of choice, an economic and even moral price has been paid as well. Almost from the start, the blessings of coffee and tea in the West were inextricably bound up 
with the sins of slavery and imperialism in a global system of production organized with such brutal rationality that it would only have been fueled by what else? Caffeine itself. And guys, I'm having trouble with this battery. If this battery runs out, you can pick up this book yourself. <clears throat> Coffee and tea as commodities produced in the global south to be consumed in the north entangled all who drank them in an intricate new web of international economic relations, specifically colonialism and imperialism. The spice trade, another vibrant market in plant stimulants, preceded the caffeine trade by a few centuries but it was minuscule by comparison and on the consuming end mainly involved the affluent. By the end of the 18th century, tea was being consumed daily by just about everyone in England. It became the most important commodity traded by the British East India Company, accounting for an estimated 5% of the nation's gross national product, quoting David Davies, an English cleric from the late 1700s, quote, it appears a very strange thing that the common people of any European nation should be obliged to use as part of their daily diet two articles imported from opposite sides of the earth close quote. You know, this was 240 years ago. <clears throat> the two articles Davies had in mind were tea and sugar, which became paired in England soon after tea's introduction, somewhat surprisingly since tea in China was never sweetened. No one knows exactly why the practice took root, but the tea imported by Great Britain tended to be bitter and as a hot beverage could readily absorb large amounts of sugar. In fact, one of the principal uses of sugar in Britain was a sweetener of tea and the, that custom drove a substantial increase in sugar consumption, which in turn drove an expansion of slavery to run the sugar plantations of the Caribbean. An estimated 70% of the slave trade supported sugar production. Coffee was even more directly implicated in the institution of slavery, especially in Brazil where coffee growers imported large numbers of slaves from Africa to work on their coffee plantations. How many tea and coffee drinkers in Europe had any idea that their sober and civilized habit rested on the back of such brutality. The British East Indian Company's tea trade with China bore a moral stain of another kind. Since the company had to pay for tea in sterling and China had little interest in English goods, England began running a ruinous trade deficit with China. Hmm. The East India Company came up with two clever strategies to improve its balance of payments position. It turned to India, a country it controlled that had no history of large-scale tea production and transformed it into a leading producer of tea and opium, which this ties back to the first part of the book. The tea was exported to England and the opium over the strenuous objections of the Chinese government was smuggled into China by the East India Company in what would quickly become a ruinous and 
unconscionable flood. By 1828, the opium trade represented 16% of the company's revenues, and within five years, the East India Company was sending more than 5 million pounds of Indian opium to China every year. This certainly helped close the trade deficit, <laughs> I bet it did, but millions of Chinese citizens became addicted, contributing to the decline of what had been a great civilization. After the Chinese emperor ordered the seizure of all stores of opium in 1839, Britain declared war to keep the opium flowing. Owing to the Royal Navy's vastly superior firepower, the British quickly prevailed, forcing open five treaty ports and <clears throat> taking possession of Hong Kong in a crushing blow to China's sovereignty and economy. So here was another moral cost of caffeine. In order for the English mind to be sharpened with tea, the Chinese mind had to be clouded with opium. Those of us who enjoy a cup of coffee or tea today know scarcely more about the system that produces it than consumers did during the time of slavery or the opium wars. The intricate supply chain that delivers us our daily dose of caffeine is largely invisible, and while it no longer rests on the backs of African slaves or Chinese opium addicts, a regime of economic exploitation remains at its base. <clears throat> For every $4 latte, only a few pennies ever reach the farmers who grew the beans, most of whom are smallholders working a few steeply raked acres in some rural corner of a tropical country. In recent years, the global price for coffee beans has moved in giant destructive swings as the market does what markets do. <clears throat> scout, scout the world for the lowest priced producer at any given moment. In the 1960s, the world's coffee growing nations banded together to limit those swings by managing supply cooperatively. The International Coffee Agreement Act export quotas for each coffee produce, producing nation as a way to keep price stable within a certain range. This worked for many years, but in 1989, after the rise of neoliberal economics and the consolidation of buying power in the hands of a small number of multinational corporations, the coffee agreement fell apart. Prices now, meaning up until today, are set by futures markets in London and New York and move up and down dramatically and unpredictably, although they've mostly moved up, 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 as we'll talk about in a minute. In many years, farmers are forced to sell their beans for less than it costs them to grow them. Of the $10 you may pay for a pound of coffee, only about $1 ever reaches the farmer who grew it. At the highest end of the market, a handful of companies like Starbucks and certification schemes like Fair Trade International are seeking to improve the lot of coffee farmers by paying them a guaranteed price. And uh, I would put a big asterisk by that one. Uh, but 
a free market in any commodity crop that is grown by millions of small producers and bought by only a tiny handful of large buyers will inevitably enrich the latter while tending to impoverish the former. And uh, anyway, it goes on like this. This is a very good book. But anyway, uh, I wish he had spent more time talking about climate change. Surprisingly, this is all that Michael Pollan says about climbing, climate change. Uh, blah, blah. Coffee likes tropical mountains because the plant needs both plenty of rain and exceptionally good drainage in order to thrive. Growing at higher elevation also allows coffee to escape one of the most destructive pests, the fungus that causes coffee leaf rust. Well, it, it, at least until now. Uh, climate change is already pushing coffee production higher up the mountain and making life difficult for farmers. Coffee plants are notoriously picky about rainfall, temperature, and sunlight, all of which are changing in Colombia, rendering lands that had always been good for coffee production no longer viable. Worldwide, the prospects for coffee production in a changing climate are, according to the agronomist, dismal. By one estimate, roughly half of the world's coffee growing acreage and an even greater proportion in Latin America will be unable to support the plant by 2050, making coffee one of the crops most immediately endangered by climate change. Capitalism, having benefited enormously from its symbiotic relationship with coffee, now threatens to kill the golden goose. And as long as my battery is hanging in there, let's read one more little section. Uh, <clears throat> Perched somewhere, he, he's on this, he's touring this coffee farm in Colombia. <clears throat> Perched somewhat crookedly on the steep slope of one of those caffeine mountains, my main thought was, you really have to give this plant a lot of credit. In less than a thousand years, it has managed to get itself from its evolutionary birthplace in Ethiopia all the way here to the mountains of South America and beyond using our species as its vector. Consider all we have done on this plant's behalf. 